You want to be totally focused. You can't take your eye off the ball. When I had troubles in the early 90s, a major article came out, and it said very strongly, everything he touches turns to gold. And I believed it. So I'd go out with models at night instead of working. But that wasn't good. And I remember I had a big lease coming up, and I, there was a big show, and I went to the show. I said, don't worry, fellas, you can handle the lease. You'll get it done. Well, I came back, they didn't get it done, and I would have had it done 100 percent. And then the market crashed in the 90s. So I had trouble, but it was sort of an amazing — I wouldn't want to do it again. It was an amazing test of yourself. Can you handle pressure? How are you under pressure? Are you smart? You know, when, when everybody's coming at you, Sometimes you see someone having enormous success, mm -hmm. and there's just something about them. Mm -hmm. You say, good for him. And I think, not just me, but when I read about the response to you, lots of people are saying that. They're cheering for you to have the accomplishments you have had. I, I feel that. Uh, I've always felt a sense of support. Um, and, I, and I think that my struggle to achieving this goal and achieving this dream is uh, something that speaks volumes. Um, I started out acting at seven years old and I struggled for so long. Um, there was a time in my life when I said, if I don't, if I'm not a star by the time I'm 18, I'm going to have to get out of the business. <laughs> and of course, I jumped to 21 and then 25 and then. I'm, I'm uh, looking in the mirror, uh, just past my mid, my mid twenties, and I haven't, I haven't received health benefits in SAG, <laughs> and we all know that with in the Screen Actors Guild, yeah. uh, you got to make seven thousand dollars in order to be eligible for health benefits. So, in fact, I didn't get health benefits until I was thirty years old. Uh, even while I was shooting Saving Private Ryan, I wasn't covered. <laughs> Uh, and I and I think that that kind of uh, rise to fame is something that's empowering for people. So uh, when they uh, when they celebrate that story, I think that they're also celebrating a you know a story that's uh, about a guy who was proactive and resourceful and did pay his dues and did struggle and uh, persevered. And believed in himself. I think you have to. I think. I think the only thing I had for so many years was uh, this confidence that I held on to very tightly. You know, was it a difference in confidence and arrogance? I mean, you, oh, absolutely. You just knew that you were getting the skills necessary to yeah. be good, right. and one moment came, mm -hmm. you'd be ready and could deliver. Right. I. I needed to be confident, at the risk even of being arrogant. Mm -hmm. I needed to be confident because I had nothing else. And if you go into a situation where you're dedicating your whole life to something, literally your whole life, all of your decisions are made with one common goal, um, then I think that you better believe in yourself, especially if you start to work mm -hmm. uh, to save money to make films. I like to ask audiences how many have major goals you'd like to achieve. And I want to ask you another question, because I've been reflecting on this. Last year I had a reoccurrence of the little C, cancer. Uh, Fifteen years ago I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and given a, a two to three year prognosis. One of the things I think that doctors should never tell someone they're terminally ill, what they should say is, my knowledge and ability to help you has terminated. But I've been reflecting on my life, and I want to ask you, and I know you've done things you feel good about, things that you're proud of, but how many of you know if you had your life to live over again, you could have done more than what you've done thus far? Raise your hands, please. That proves the point that what we do and what we accomplish in life is only a tip of the iceberg of what's possible for us. So I want to share some thoughts with you. I want you to think about three goals that you'd like to achieve in three areas of your life. Number one, what's one personal goal that you'd like to achieve? Why don't you think about that? My first personal goal was to buy my mother a home. I'm one of seven children that my 
adopted mother adopted. And I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. She was a domestic worker on Miami Beach in the United States, and she cleaned homes and she kept children. And we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. She cooked for families, and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. These were very kind and generous people. They would say, Mamie, whatever food is left over, you can pack it up and take it home to those children that you have adopted. And I used to walk around these big, beautiful mansions, and I said, Mama! And she said, What is it, Leslie? When I become a man, I'm going to buy you a big, beautiful home just like this. How many have somebody special you'd like to do something for? Raise your hands, please. Very good. We're going to show you how you can make that happen. Now I want you to think about your financial goals, growing your business, uh, advancing your career, taking your life to the next level. I want you to think about the goals that you've set for yourself, why you've invested in yourself and being here. And whatever the goals are that you've set for yourself, and I hope you've raised the bar in yourself, I want you to multiply it a hundredfold. I found that most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss. I found that most people fail in life because they do what I did for most of my life, aim too low and hit. And many aim, never aim at all. Now I want you to think about your social contribution. What will be different because you showed up? Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. One of the goals I have is reduce the number of women who die from breast cancer. My mother was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. How many men over 40? Raise your hands, please. Men over 40. Very good. One of the goals every time I speak, I encourage men to get their PSA test, which stands for prostate specific antigen, and their digital rectal examination. And I'll be glad they can check our prostate by walk, looking in our ears. You know, it's got to be a better way. <laughs> I'm turning red as I talk about it, but you can't see it. <laughs> friend of mine was at a medical convention. Hey, Les, let me give you a free rectal. I said, no, buddy, you're too motivated. <laughs> Homie, don't roll like that, you know. <laughs> One of the goals I have is teaching people how to tell their story, how to grow their business, be the voice of their business, how to improve the customer service, how to develop their leadership voice how to go from being local to being global. I want you to think about the things that you want to do with your life, the kind of impact that you want to make. And as you think about those three categories, let us say together with conviction, it's possible. Together, please. Everybody together, please. Say it's possible. You know, the easiest thing I do is come up here prepared to speak for you. But the most difficult thing that I've ever done and took me years to do was to believe that I could do it. Given my beginning, born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City with a twin brother, being adopted, being labeled educable, mentally retarded in the fifth grade and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade and failing again in the eighth grade and not having any college education. And if both my birth parents stood up and said, hello, son, I would not know either one. You know, I saw a movie late one night, and in this, this movie called Magnolia, Tom Cruise, and there was a line in there that said, we might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. How many of you know there are things that we've experienced that can impact the way we see ourselves? Raise your hand as you understand that. And so, so as you look at yourself and look at your goals, I want you to write this down. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. You have to create an achiever's mindset. Not, you have to create that yourself. My favorite book says, Be ye not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what you're doing right now is an indication of what's most important. As you begin to invest in yourself, setting aside a time to be here. This is the era where the late Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's. Accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. So as you look at yourself and look at your goals, setting aside time every day to work on your mindset, to expand your vision of what's possible for you. 
They did an interview with Warren Buffett, one of the richest men on the planet, as you're aware. And they asked him, say, what's the most important investment people can make today? And this was in the middle of the recession in the United States. Here's a guy that has billions of dollars in real estate, billions of dollars in the stock market. And he said, the most important investment you can make is in yourself. Everybody repeat after me, please. Live full. Die empty. Say it again. Live full. Die empty. After having 238 radiation seed implants, I was reading one night some words by Dr. Howard Thurman, who was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to Albert Schweitzer, to Mahatma Gandhi. He wrote, Deep is the hunger, the voice of the genuine, the centering moment. As I was reflecting on his words, he said, The ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghost of the dreams, the ideas, the abilities, the talents given to you by life, but you, for whatever reason, you never pursued those dreams. You never acted on those ideas. You never used those gifts. You never used those talents. And there they are staring at you as you're lying on your bed with large, angry eyes saying, we came to you, and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died today, what dreams, what talents, what abilities, what gifts, what ideas would die with you? One minister out of Bahamas said, the wealthiest place on the planet, it's not in the Far East where there's oil on the ground. It's not in South Africa where there are diamond mines. He said, the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. And there you see potential never realized. There you find books never written. There you find ideas never acted on. Maybe that's why Henry David Rose said, oh God, to reach the point of death, only to realize that you've never lived only to realize that you've never scraped the surface of your potential. Let us say again, live full, die empty. And so as you think about your goals and dreams, I'm suggesting that you set aside time every day if you're not doing it already, reading 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day, listening to audio programs, investing in yourself to expand your mind for what is possible, to develop a, a spirit of optimism, and then the next thing is, let us say together, it's necessary. You see, not only is it possible that you can live your dream and that you have to sell yourself on that every day. There's an African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. I didn't do this for 14 years because I convinced myself I couldn't do it. I would go see the late Zig Ziglar and Jim Rowan and the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and I saw Tony Robbins and, and my heart said, I could do that. How many of you like to help people? Raise your hands, please. I said, I can do that. And then when I would go to the parking lot, my, my inner voice would become activated and say, Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have a college education. Les Brown, you can't do that. You've never worked for a major corporation. Les Brown, you can't do that. You, who wants to hear anything you've got to say? How many ever thought about something you wanted to do and you, you talk yourself out of it? Raise your hands, please. And so that's, that's why it's necessary that we work on ourselves. And let us say together, OQP. Only quality people. Write that down. As you think about your goals and dreams over the next two years, over the next two days, it's very important that you look at the people in your life and you ask the question, what is this relationship doing to me? MIT did a study. The study indicated that you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. Well, when I heard that, I got a lot of broke people out of my life. My mama said, son, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll become number 10. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough out of Atlanta said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So as you think about your goals and dreams, detoxify your life. Les, can I change them? No. It's a full-time job changing yourself. And there's some people that are so negative, they can walk into a dark room and begin to develop.
And so it's very important that you look at the people that's in your circle and begin to understand, are you growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually and professionally? Are they an asset to you or a liability to you? The other thing is, as you look at your goals and look at your dreams, let us repeat this, please. Make your move before you're ready. Yeah, write that down. See, I said, well, I don't have a college education. I don't have any paper or alphabets behind my name. And I realized that if you want to make it in life, you want to make your mark, you've got to become a risk taker. Viscott said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you can't become your best. And if you can't become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? I like what Helen Keller said. She said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. So you have something special. You are here because there's something in your heart of hearts that said, I want more. I can do more. You are here because you're different. How many of you know people who should be here? Raise your hands, please. Yeah, so you're here because you're different. You're uncommon. One man said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dull by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will never call before any master, nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. Give yourselves a round of applause for having an uncommon desire to reach your goals, to achieve something great with your life. Bring your level of energy up. So as you look at yourself, not only must we begin to upgrade our relationships, but the other thing is, as you look at your goals and look at your dreams, write this down. You will fail your way to success. See, 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. You're going to make some mistakes. And it's okay. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. It's worth doing right if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, it's worth doing badly until you get it right. You have to be willing to experiment with life. I've done a variety of things and I had absolutely no idea I had the ability to do those things. Here's what I can say about you and I don't even know you. You've got greatness within you, but you will not discover your greatness in your comfort zone. You've got to be willing to get outside of your comfort zone because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. And most people, they go to their graves with their greatness still in them. Maybe that's why one woman said in a moment of anguish, what if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? Here's something else as you think about your goals and dreams. What's your why? Why do you want to do it? What drives you? This is my mother. She's 46 years old when she adopted first Wesley and I and then five other children. And she was a driving force in my life. Which one am I? On the right or the left? I'm the cute one. Which one am I now? <laughs> I'm the one on the left. All right, yes, it is. And as you think about your goals and dreams, think about somebody that you love, that inspired you, someone that you love, that you admire. And I think about my background. And this is Wesley and I eating sugar cane. You see, we were not born with a silver spoon in our mouths. Yeah. Do y'all eat sugar cane here in Australia? Anybody ever had sugar cane? Most of you have not. Just two people here. Yeah, it's a, it's it's sweet. It's it's interesting. Well, you know, we we were born in the area of Florida where you eat sugar cane. Donald Trump father gave him two hundred million dollars to become successful. How many of you know if I give you $200 million, you got a good shot at becoming successful? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> My mama gave us two pieces of sugar cane, and we had an advantage. Room always get quiet when I say that. Donald Trump was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. If you had a choice between eating a silver spoon and eating sugar cane, which one would you eat? Sugar cane, I told you we had an advantage. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then... 
I met someone who changed my life. See, what we do and what we accomplish in life is a result of the story we believe about ourselves. And I met this friend, I was a disc jockey at the time, and he said, Les Brown, you're more than a disc jockey. Les Brown, you're more than a paycheck. Les Brown, you can do more. How many of you had somebody see something in you you didn't see in yourself? Raise your hands, please. And I couldn't see it at the time. But he continued to talk to me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And eventually, I became an entrepreneur. I began to book concerts and not just doing a radio show, but I invited entertainers to come to town. And these little guys came in 1973. There I am standing in the back. That's Michael Jackson there at 10 years of age in 1973. I didn't know who they were going to become, they didn't know who I was going to become. The hand that you shook in the audience, you have no idea whose hand you just shook. You don't know who they are. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for that person whose hand you just shook. That person, they have greatness within them, and you have greatness within you. And to prove it, you were chosen one out of 400 million sperm. There's something in you. And God said, I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you. There's something you have that the world needs not. If you don't give it to us, we will all be deprived. And so as you think about your goals and dreams, how many of you like to make a difference in your community? Raise your hands, please. You have the ability to do that. I ran for the Ohio legislature. Had no idea, had the ability to do that past 14 bills my first term. You have greatness within you. You can make more impact than you can ever begin to imagine. When you're willing to challenge yourself, let us say together, leap. Everybody together say leap. And grow your wings on the way down. Yeah, see, one of the things about life, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna make some mistakes, you're gonna fail your way to success. But you've got to be willing to experiment. You've got to be willing to push yourself. You've got to be willing to challenge yourself by putting yourself in a perpetual state of discomfort. And so the things happen in life. When you have goals and dreams, things happen. I had no idea. Midway of my third term, my mother became ill. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. And my brothers and sisters called me and said they're going to put her in a nursing home. And I said, no. They said, we thought you would say that. We've interviewed the best nursing homes in Dade County. I said, I said no. So I had a problem. How can one woman raise seven children who couldn't take care of themselves, but seven grown people couldn't take care of one woman? I had a problem with that. And I said no. So I resigned from the Ohio legislature and I came back to Miami to take care of mama and took care of her until 89. And there are things as you have your goals, things are going to happen to you that you can't anticipate. Some of you are in the eye of the storm now. Things are gonna happen. And don't say, well, why does this have to happen to me? Why not you? Who would you suggest? <laughs> you wanna give us some names or email addresses? That's really what I said the second time I got cancer. <laughs> They had told me that cancer had metastasized the seven areas of my body. I started laughing. He said, why are you laughing? Are you in denial? I said, no, I feel like Mother Teresa. He said, what do you mean? She said, Lord, I know you know how much I can bear. I just wish I, you didn't have so much confidence in me. <laughs> <laughs> There's times in your life when things are going to happen that you've got to begin to put your dream on hold. And you might have to reinvent yourself. How many have already gone through that? Raise your hands, please. It's called life. And don't tell everybody about it. 80% don't care and 20% glad is you. You have to suck it up and handle it. That's what it called being in business, being an entrepreneur, being a risk taker, walking by faith and not by sight. Stuff happens to you. And so I had to go in a new direction. And I decided to tell my story. How many of you got a story? Raise your hands, please. 
How many of you have gone through some things in life that you can teach some other people? Raise your hands, please. How many of you, like me, had periods in your life when you were temporarily insane? Raise your hands. <laughs> See, there's some people, I'm one of those, I have a training, 100,000 voices of hope outside of politics and outside of religion, both of which I believe unwittingly polarize and divide people, and teach people how to deliver a message of hope and give people methods and techniques that will help them to change their lives and, and begin to move their lives to another level. You have something special. You have greatness within you. That story that you have can impact people's lives. Mike Williams talked to me, and it changed my life. It began to expand my vision. How many of you have a college education? Raise your hands, please. Very good. Over 90 percent. How many of you ever give a lecture at Harvard University? Raise your hands, please. No hands up. That's in your future. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, that's in my future. That's in my future. Everybody point at me right now. Point at me right now. Point at me lovingly right now. Say, Les Brown. Everybody together, say, Les Brown, if you can do it, I can do it. And this time when you say, I can do it, say it with conviction. Point at me again, Les Brown, if you can do it, I can do it. Shake someone's hand and you're ready and left and say, I'm ready to play a bigger game. Do that right now. Say, I'm ready to play a bigger game. Absolutely. Yes. It says you look at yourself and look at your goals. There's some things that you can do when you challenge yourself, when you go outside your comfort zone. There are things that will come in the direction of your life that you can't even begin to imagine. That you're going to begin to evolve and go to new levels that will amaze you. And I tell you these things not to impress you, but to impress upon you. You have something special. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. And so what I'm suggesting that you do is to stretch yourself. That you constantly look for ways as an entrepreneur, how can you begin to set yourself apart from the competition? What is it that you can do that can make you stand out? What are the market takeaways that you can do? One of the things that I learned as a speaker, and as a trainer, as an entrepreneur and a small business operator is that you've got to find something that you love and that you master that. Henry David Thoreau said, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. As you look at yourself as a business operator, as you look at yourself as an entrepreneur, as you look at yourself as a person that want to make a mark with your life, that want to leave a legacy, you've got to be hungry. Let us say together, I'm hungry to do more. I'm hungry to stretch myself. I'm hungry to take my life to another level. I never forget this gentleman that I'm going to talk with tomorrow. He's now in his 90s. He's blind from glaucoma. And I never forget. He said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for me. And I said, oh, sir, I can't do that. He says, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, look at me. Yes, sir. Go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, I, I can't, sir. And the other students started laughing. They said, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley is smart. He's DT. He said, what's DT? He's the dumb twin. And I said, I am, sir. As the students laughed, as some of you did. And he came from behind his desk. He looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that was a turning point in my life. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated. Because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe, who said, look at a man the way that he is, he only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be, then he becomes what he should be. He said, young man, what do you want to do with your life? I said, sir, I, I want to make my mother proud, sir. He said, how do you plan to do that? I said, when I get out of high school, I'd like to be a disc jockey. He said, is that right? I said, yes, sir. He says, good, I'm going to tell you some things to do. I said, what is it? He says, number one. He said, I want you to work on your mind. He said, here's some motivational materials I want you to listen to by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and, and Earl Nightingale. Train your thinking. Write this down. This is very important. What you think about, you bring about. He said, I want you to train your mind to serve you. And I want you to focus on becoming a disc jockey every day. I want you to see yourself on the radio talking 
to thousands of people. I want you to see yourself doing the things that you want to accomplish. Hold the vision. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Whatever area, whatever you want to do, whatever business that you're in, whatever industry that you're in, you want to see yourself there and hold the picture of what it is you want to accomplish. And I said, sir, I said, I want to be a disc jockey, but I don't, I don't have a job yet. And then he quoted Whitney Young. He said, young man, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. He said, you got to be hungry. I said, I am hungry, sir. He said, good. Here are my car keys. At 12 noon, I want you to go in my car and turn on the radio and listen to Paul Harvey. Who is Paul Harvey, sir? He's the world's greatest communicator. He said, whatever you want to do, you want to find people who master that because success leaves clues. And that's the same thing I'm suggesting to you. Whatever area that you want to go in, in this finances, in business, insurance industry, whatever area that you're interested in, find the people who are mastering that and follow their example. He said, and let me share something else. I said, yes, sir. He said, watch your relationships. They're nourishing relationships and they're toxic relationships. Nourishing relationships, they bring the best out of you. They inspire you. Toxic relationships, they drain you. I said, I will, sir. I do exactly what you're telling me to do, sir. And then he said, uh, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. I've given you everything I can give you you got to go out into the marketplace and face the music. I said, thank you, sir. I went to apply for a job on Miami Beach. Milton Butterball Smith was the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. Young man, do you have any journalism in your background? No, sir, I don't. Do you have any experience in broadcasting? No, sir, but I visualize myself being on the air every day, sir. I practice. All I want is a shot. Just, just give me a shot. He says, no, we don't have any job for you. How many of you ever been rejected? Raise your hands, please. I was devastated with rejection. I went back and I said, hey, Mr. Washington, they said no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you got to be hungry. Go back again. I said, yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterfall. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. Young man, weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir. D didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I, I didn't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. Nobody was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? Yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? Yes, sir. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I don't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was singing for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you? He looked at me with rage. He says, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. My favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. How many of you are serious about reaching your goals? Raise your hands, please. Here's something I encourage you to write this down. Provide more service than you get paid for. As small business operators, and you're going to do market takeaways, you've got to provide more service than you get paid for. You've got to build relationships with people. You've got to be able to tell your story because people do business with people they know, like, and trust. You've got to look for ways, as the lady who became the dominant force in her industry. And they said, how did you get here? In an industry that's dominated by men, and she said, it's not our intention to please our customers or to satisfy our customers. Our intention is to amaze them with the quality of the service that we provide for them. And so you have to literally amaze your customers. Go above and beyond as you begin to anticipate what their needs are and look for ways in which you can begin to impact them. And so as you look at your goals and dreams, the people that are willing to do that are hungry. He said, Mr. Brown, go face the music. I went to apply for this job three different times. They said, 
No, finally they asked me to become the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I'd go get their lunch and their dinner, and I'd stand in the control rooms knowing my time would come. Let us say together, my time will come. And on the weekends, they would come out to the parking lot, and their cars would be waxing clean, inside out. They said, hey, who did this? Write this down. Give before you ask. Give before you ask. I was just trying to get my foot in the door. I wanted to establish a reputation of being a go-to person, a person of resource, resourcefulness, a person that's relentless and unstoppable, a person that can get things done. I said, I did, sir. How much you charge? Nothing, sir. I just wanted to help out. I was building relationships. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. Look here. Donna Ross and the Supremes are coming to town, the Four Tops and the Temptations. Here are my car keys. Pick them up and take them to the Fountain Blue Hotel on Miami Beach. It'll be my pleasure to serve you, sir. I was driving these entertainers in the disc jockeys' big, long Cadillacs. I didn't have any driver's license, but I was driving like I had so. <laughs> then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. Rock and Roger got so drunk, he could not complete the show. He began to stutter his words. He was about to fall off the chair. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one there, looking at him through the control room window, <laughs> walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink rock. I'd have gone get him some more if he'd asked me to. <laughs> then pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager and answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mama and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn on the radio. I'm about to come on the air. <laughs> I waited for about 20 minutes, and then I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get old Rock out of the way. I put on a fast record. I said, look out, this is me, LB Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and doubly qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. Get the old man a round of applause. I was hungry. I was hungry. Shake someone's hand on your right and left, look them in the eyes and say, you got to be hungry. Do that right now. Shake someone's hand and say, you got to be hungry. People that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. People that are hungry believe, always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. People that are hungry know if you want to be successful, you must be willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. I didn't do what I'm doing right now because it was hard. How many of you decided not to do something because it was hard? Raise your hands, please. I want you to write this down. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. Complain. Point at your circumstances, give up your power, blame the government, blame the economy. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. It's hard to make a radical change in your behavior. It's hard to take ownership. It's hard to swallow the bitter pill that wherever you find yourself, 
at some point in time you made an appointment to be there. That's hard. That's hard. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do this, what is hard, your life will be easy. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what you want to do with your life. Here's what I know about your being here. That there's something in you that waits and listens to the voice of the genuine in yourself. It will be perhaps the only guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, all of your life, your days will be spent on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And I submit to you, the reason that you're here is that in your heart of hearts, you've said, I'm going to pull my own strings. I say to you, the reason that you're here is something about you that says, I'm going to control my own destiny. There's something about you that when you pointed your fingers at your circumstances, you realize you had three pointing at yourself. So I want to dedicate something to you that my mother loved to hear me say. Mama was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. I want to dedicate this to you, to the achiever in you, to the greatness in you, to the unexpressed gifts, talents, and abilities that you have in you that's hungry to get out. And it says simply this, Leslie, yes ma'am, mama, say that thing for me, boy, that it makes me feel good. It says simply this, if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that your dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it, and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, poverty, famish, or gulf, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want. 